All right. Uh, well, welcome today for the third of our lectures um, in which we talk about functionality in Mathematica that goes sort of beyond the basic syntax. Uh, in the first lecture, we talked about graph theory. In the last lecture, we started talking about uh, visualization and visualization options. And today we're sort of going to be exploring some further options uh, that are available in the Wolfram language uh, to allow you to create uh, data visualizations or function visualizations that are appropriate to your data type and mm, to whatever field you're presenting it for. <clears throat> and I'll get, I'll get more into what options are available and uh, you know, what kind of uh, expressions are built into the Wolfram language. One of the things I really wanted to emphasize in our last lecture was that for a wide variety of data uh, types, there are built-in Wolfram language functions that are designed to visualize those types of data. Uh, and as we continue, we're going to be seeing that there are many more options uh, that govern styles and, uh, you know, yeah, style options for data presentation. <clears throat> and you may notice that my slide uh, looks a little bit different from the way it did last time. Somebody asked a question about uh, a dark mode equivalent for Mathematica. And although it's not a true dark mode, the closest thing uh, that is built in is the reverse color style sheet, which is visible under the format dropdown menu, format, style sheet, reverse color. And that takes you to this nice black background with white text on it. And uh, it is a little more easy to read uh, on, you know, if you're used to a dark mode uh, environment. I'm just going to turn it back just to have a little more consistency with the other lectures. I'm sorry if any of you are viewing this at night. Ah. But, um, so as we move on, so today we're going to be talking about uh, the options that are available for styling uh, the graphics that we are creating with all of these various functions that are designed for visualiz uh, visualizing data of various types. <clears throat> So um, there are some sort of overall functions that just have a bunch of built-in methods of visualization. So plot theme is sort of the big one. If you have a list plot or any, any kind of other plot, you can specify the plot theme as, a, as one of a number of predefined styles. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different styles built in. So if you're working in uh, different fields, you know, there are some that are designed for marketing, some are designed for journal publications, some are designed for, um, for other, other uh, kinds of presentation that you might be giving. And uh, so there are also many options that uh, modify particular elements of a uh, graph or other graphics expression. <clears throat> So there is a lot of control. There is a lot of control that you have in the Wolfram language over how things get displayed. Uh, plot theme is the most sort of top level option, but you can control pretty much every aspect of a, uh, a graphic. So here is an example. We looked at some plots of uh, the relative uh, popularity of baby names over time, Mary and John. And so you can see here, that we can we have this little drop down menu that is going to allow us to modify the options that are being passed to this graph and we're going to update that dynamically so we can see that this is the default uh, option for style for everything but we can see that there are built in options for you know business presentations uh, marketing examples which are a little more flashy there's monochrome which uh, which includes different uh, points for all of the elements uh, in the data so it's ideal for publication in black and white journals. There is, uh, you know, there's scientific, which has, you know, different fonts and different tick sizes and different default colors. Uh, there's stuff that's, you know, matches the visualization that you might see for uh, companies like Google. Uh, I believe this is intended to reflect the uh, the popularity of, of certain terms that they have, the, I forget what it's called, but um, you can visualize how popular certain words are over time as they appear in various bodies of text. <clears throat> so all of these are just built in. If you want this, if you want your plot to look like this, all you have to do is specify plot theme web or plot theme business. And that'll, that'll just get you this. Uh, there's nothing extra you have to do. 
You can, however, control all of these elements individually. So you can specify options for all of these independent parts. So you can specify axes as uh, elements of this. You can specify a single axis. You can specify no axes or minimal axes or a grid crossing across everything. All of these are built-in options. <clears throat> All of these are built-in things. Uh, you can specify thin lines, medium lines, thick lines, dashed lines. And again, these are only the built-in options. You can actually specify uh, exactly how thick you want the lines to be. You can specify exactly how large you want these plot markers to be. And we'll be exploring those a little more as we go on. But the point is, just as there are many different built-in functions for uh, visualizing different types of data, there are many, many, many different built-in options for customizing that presentation. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, plotting fu uh, charting functions like uh, pie chart or bar chart also have their own set independent sets of plot themes. Uh, oh, yeah. And you can specify all of these different styles for presenting various types of data. And so you can see how all of these options are getting passed to plot theme. Uh, I've specified a monochrome, bold colors, and large labels. And all of those are just named options that get passed to uh, plot theme. And you can see how that gets reflected on the existing chart. Hmm. Now, uh, with regards to color, because that is an important feature of, uh, of constructing readable uh, visualizations, you can specify color in many different ways. There are a number of built-in named color schemes. And actually, let me sure, make sure that's visible. All right. So is, is the color scheme palette that popped up visible here? Excellent. So you can see that uh, when the color scheme palette pops up, you can select individual uh, colors or color schemes that are present in this list. And this is, this is some of the color schemes that are available in uh, the Wolfram language. And you can directly access these if you want to color your plots, uh, your plots in a way that reflects one of these uh, gradients. So if you want to create a plot style that uh, you know has a distinct set of colors but isn't too harsh on the eyes, you may want to use dark rainbow. Uh, if you want to make something that uh, is reflecting a landscape, you know, it might be a height map or something like that, you can use one of these. You have a wide variety of built-in options. And these are all just the named options. So these are all the ones that are just built in. They exist in the Wolfram language by default, and you don't have to do anything extra to get them. Uh, and there are also color models. So you can represent colors in a wide variety of different ways. You can create uh, different gray levels by uh, the function gray level, and that will return a, a color. Similarly, the function RGB color, where you can specify the red, green, and blue values and an alpha channel, uh, will return a color uh, with a certain level of transparency. You can include uh, uh, graphics expressions with transparencies in the Wolfram language, and, they, and those will be combined in the way you would expect. <clears throat> Similarly, there's hue and CMYK colors. Uh, but basically, you can use these functions to construct any color you want based on RGB alpha values. <clears throat> and there are also some dedicated functions that are there to make this process a little easier. If you don't have exactly the RGB colors, but maybe you have a color swatch or something that you want to compare it to. So if I have this, uh, this system dialogue input color, if I click on this, it'll bring up this little window. And whatever I pick in here and select will be returned as a color. And let me zoom in and show that again, just to make sure it's clearly visible. So if I click on this, oops, if I click on this, 
It brings up a dialog, which allows me to select the color. I pick one and that is reflected in this little box here. And then you can use that. You can use that color in some other expression. So if you decide that you, you pick some color from here and you want to use that, you can use that color as a graphics directive. I could, I could copy this out of here and uh, specify that I want this color, this color that I've picked here, to be used for a plot. Uh, additionally, if you wanted to create a color gradient between two colors, you can just use the function blend to interpolate between two different colors and create your own gradient color scheme that way. And you can blend between multiple colors so that uh, at a particular value in a gradient, it's one color. At another value, it's another color. At a third color, it's uh, a third value, it's a third color, etc. So you can just blend all of these together uh, to create your own unique color gradient. And so you can sort of play around with that as well. And this is all visible in the presentation notebook. So you can create whatever kind of color scheme you might want. And you can see that as I move in between, uh, move the slider around, I can vary the uh, location at which the color gradient in question has a particular color. So I, and here's an example. I, I define a color function right here. I call that function B. And then I can specify that as the color function for a, uh, a plot that I create. And so you can see here that rather than the default orange color, the color function is determined by this blending that I've created up here. All right. So beyond color, you might also want to uh, you might also want to change the point size of your various plots. Uh, lots, of, lots of expressions involve plotting data points, and you want to make sure that those points are clearly visible. Uh, but you may also want to make them smaller if you have too many of them. So there are plenty of reasons to use point sizes of various types. But of course, uh, that's something you can control. And you can see exactly down here how the plot is changing as I vary the slider. So you can specify that the plot style is some uh, has some absolute point size specified in it. Uh, so I can specify that the point size is 9.25 printer's points. If I specify that it's 12, then each of these points is going to be the same size as a, a piece of 12 point font. You can also specify the uh, point size in terms of a uh, scale relative to the entire size of the plot. So you'll notice that with this, if I resize the plot, the points will get larger as well. With an absolute point size specification, that is not the case. With an absolute point size specification, the points stay the same size relative to the size of the screen uh, as opposed to relative to the size of the uh, overall plot. <clears throat> And there are some presets built in because in the Wolfram language, there are at least a few presets for pretty much every option. So with automatic, that's just the basic default point size. You can also specify tiny points, which may not actually be visible on this screen. Uh, small, medium, large. And you can just use any of these uh, if you feel that they uh, are best suited to your uh, data presentation. Or you could specify exactly exactly how big you want the uh, plot points to be. Similarly, in addition to point size, there is also a line thickness option. Again, you can specify these as absolute size or scaled relative to the overall size of the plot. And again, there are a whole bunch of built-in presets. There's tiny, there's small, there's medium, large, thick, and Uh, you can also specify that lines should be dashed. Actually, let me set that back to thick. So the dashed, you can make uh, your line segments dashed or dotted or dot dashed, where it alternates between dots and dashes. Uh, you can change how the uh, ends of the lines are uh, formatted. You can change how they are capped. 
I don't know how visible that's going to be on the screen. Let me uh, really in increase that and turn off the dashing. But you can see that we can change how smooth the line segments are. Because each of these uh, each of these lines is drawn between points and is consequently made out of several different line segments, which are all then drawn on top of each other. Uh, and you can change the cap form to uh, make the end of this line segment a little smoother. And similarly, you can add arrowheads. You can add them to the axes. You can change how many of them there are. You have a wide variety of options for visualizing your axes as well. Um, so for 2D objects, such as polygons or rectangles or other expressions, you have independent options for varying how the uh, edges and the interiors uh, appear. So you can change the uh, thickness of the borders. And so you can make that large, medium, thick, thin, or just set it to however big you want it to be. You can uh, make those 1D boundaries uh, to be dashing. You can uh, change them independently. You can also independently vary the, oops. You can also independently vary the color of the uh, rectangles in question. And again, for basically any other kind of 2D uh, graphics expression, you can modify the face form to change how the interior looks. And there are a whole bunch of other options that are dedicated to modifying the style of a particular element of a graph. We've talked about plot theme and plot style, which apply to an overall graph. You can also specify that the axes are going to appear in a particular way. Axes style red, just a very basic specification that makes the axes red. And you can combine elements of a particular plot theme uh, and a specification for a particular element of that plot. So you can specify a particular plot theme, like this one that's designed sort of a Google style that we looked at before. And then we can specify on top of that that the frame style is red. Uh, so this goes in a uh, order from more to less um, objects. Of, mm, options with higher specificity have a higher priority. So even though the default option for the axes in plot theme web is black, frame style red is more specific because it applies to a more specific part of the uh, plot and consequently overwrites it. <clears throat> and so you can see here how that priority stacks up for some of the different options and what can affect the other. So in th this is an example in which the plot theme is web, just like before. Uh, there is a plot label and inside the plot label, we have two independent styles. We have the label style, which gives us the overall uh, style for the label as blue. But then we wrote a specific style for this individual word, which is orange. So you can see how all of these sort of affect each other. And all of these are available options for uh, changing graphics visualization. You've got frame label, you got plot theme, you got plot label, you got frame tick style, you got frame style, you got label style. All of these will independently affect different parts of the visualization. All right. Uh, and similarly, so you've got chart style for charting functions like bar chart or uh, pie chart. You've got plot style for plot functions. And you've also got a geo styling option. Uh, in the last lecture, I talked about uh, some of the geographic visualization options that exist in the Wolfram language. Uh, and that basically, that sets the following, that follows the same basic idea as the uh, edge style versus face style that I mentioned when we were talking about the histogram. The interior and the boundary have their own independent visualization options. So this may take just a second to finish loading because the geographic data has, does have to be downloaded from the internet. Ah, unfortunately, I'm able to download this information from the uh, servers right now. 
if you once you have this notebook, you should be able to just evaluate this normally. I don't know why I'm unable to download uh, those ranges. It's possible there's a temporary outage. All right. So, are there any questions on the themes and styles and options of the Wolfram language? All right. Looks like, you know, I think this was pretty straightforward. Uh, and here is sort of a glossary, which will take you to the various function pages for some of the other options as well. Moving on. So labeling, uh, in addition to just changing the way that things look or the color or size that things are, you may want to uh, you may want to provide labels or annotations to a chart to you know indicate more clearly what something is. So of course you can add labels to individual plot elements. You can put uh, labels on axes and frames, you know, just to specify what an axis is supposed to represent. You can also specify. Uh, you can also attach. Uh, you can also attach annotations to particular ticks. So for instance, if I don't want to have automatically generated ticks, you can in fact specify, OK, this tick is going to display uh, a particular uh, value or a, a particular label. If I wanted to keep a, a chart ambiguous as to the actual scale, I could specify that the ticks just display A, 2A, 3A, and never specify what A is. <clears throat> and you can also specify callouts, which will point to particular elements of a plot and attach a label to those. And you can also create legends to you know, display a scale outside the plot and indicate what that's supposed to represent. So let's explore that a little bit more. Just like last time, we can see uh, a basic uh, chart, which has an x-axis, which is supposed to indicate time, and a y-axis, which might indicate something else. We can turn uh, axes on and off. We can turn ticks on and off. Oops. We can change where the axes origin is located. And we can specify, uh, we can specify grid lines. We can specify our labels. So we can see here that the plot label is just example. I could change it to something else. Ah, I see. The issue here is that the, va the variable example with a lowercase e already has a value, and the Wolfram language is trying to evaluate it inside the plot label. That's the danger of using symbols instead of strings, like I should have been doing. And I can specify that the font size is something a little bit bigger. And I can also specify that I want the label style to be orange. So it's all those things that I was talking about before. And so you can see down here exactly how these options are being passed to list plot. And in exactly the same way, you have these similar set of options for charts. You have a plot label. And similarly for 3D graphics, like this 3D bar chart. 
you have all of these different action, uh, options. You can specify where the axis edge is, i.e. where all these rectangles in this bar chart are lined up. And you can specify that for each independent uh, axis. So you can specify that the x-axis should start here. Specify that the y-axis uh, should be labeled here. And the z-axis should, should be labeled uh, here. You can specify where all of those ticks and tick marks appear. You can specify which uh, sides of this imaginary box that we're plotting inside are displayed. You can specify, by default, it's the ones that are in the back relative to the uh, camera angle. But I can turn on all of them. I can put this plot in a little box, which might be useful for some visualization. And again, you can specify labels and label styles. Now, uh, ticks are extremely customizable. And when I say that, I mean, you can specify every single tick. And you can specify exactly how long every single tick is and exactly what label it has. Uh, the tick specification. The tick specification uh, consists of a position, a label, a length in the positive and negative directions, and a style. So you can specify where it's going to appear on the axis. You can specify what is written underneath it. You can specify how far it extends above the axis and below the axis, or to the right of the axis and to the left of the axis, and what style it has. So here we have an example. Uh, the position is at the uh, x value 1950. There is no label. Uh, the positive length is 0 0.4, and the negative length is 0, and it's red. And so we can see that that is exactly what we've created. Uh, and it also includes all of the other examples, uh, or excuse me, all of the other ticks that were created by default. That is these. So uh, the table of i, i, 0, 0 0.01, where i goes from 1910 to 1970 in increments of 10. And so we can see that that is exactly reflected here. These ticks here are labeled with their individual years, 1910, 1920. They do not extend at all above the x-axis, and they extend a little bit below the x-axis. Uh, and if you don't know exactly uh, how to create the ticks that reflect the uh, original axes, you can use the function find divisions to do so. So you can basically, you can get all of these automatically instead of constructing them by hand. Now, if you have a particular set of uh, curves or data sets or any other piece of data in your uh, expression that you would like to draw attention to, you can do callouts. <clears throat> so basically, if you have some data uh, series of data sets and you want to specify what exactly they are, you can attach a little label to them. And you have a wide variety of independent options that allow you to style uh, all of these labels. So all of these individually are the marker, the leader, the gap, the neck, the frame, the label, the background, and uh, the margin. So you can, you can customize all of these independently uh, in order to reflect whatever style you think this should have. So here's an example. Here we have a bar chart, which indicates uh, a particular individual associated with this data set. And you can see exactly how Let me move this away a little bit. Ah, it's not active. There we go. So you can move the, uh, the position of the callout around like this. And you can see how these, uh, these numbers down here, which indicate the position, are changing. And uh, just like with all those plotting options, there are a number of built-in options. You can change uh, the position relative to uh, the 1D uh, x-axis or the 2D axis. So you can, you can say that you're trying to uh, attach the data set to, uh, excuse me, you're trying to attach the callout to a particular data set. But in fact, if you want, you can put 
the uh, the end of the call out exact uh, anywhere you want it. So I'm just going to turn this off, set that back to automatic. Now, you can change the length of the call out. You can change the angle at which it uh, approaches the uh, thing it's supposed to be touching. And change that length a little bit more so it's a little more visible. And you can change the appearance options of the actual text as it appears. You can change exactly what is shown uh, at the tip of the marker to indicate where it, what the, to indicate the thing it's supposed to be touching. And you can do this automatically with the function labeled. So the function labeled will automatically label uh, a data set in a list plot or a curve in an ordinary plot like this. And you can just make that like that. You can also specify uh, how everything in the plot should be labeled automatically with a labeling function. And the labeling function here is a callout. So it's just like the callouts that we saw before, except these are determined automatically. And if you are, are wondering about the syntax, uh, the option that is being passed to labeling function is a pure function in the Wolfram language. If, if, you know, if you talk about lambda functions, something that uh, it has a, basically a blank slot in it and whatever is being passed to this function gets substituted in, uh, and re in and replaces this expression. This is slot one is how this is read in the Wolfram language. And the ampersand at the end just indicates that anything in the preceding expression should be treated as a pure function. Hmm. And so uh, the placed function is a powerful tool in the Wolfram language in all of these options that we've discussed previously for specifying where things are. Uh, so placed is a function that allows you to say where you want something to be. Uh, the presets that exist are top, bottom, left, right, center, above, below, before, and after. So anything that appears in your data set, you can see that these labels, the names associated with the data set, are appearing in some place relative to the actual bar chart. And some of these, uh, you can specify that these would appear in a particular status area, which is not currently visible, but you can specify that it's going to be in the tooltip. So if I hover over this, now I can see that these labels are placed inside the tooltip that, uh, that appears when I hover over something, as opposed to just the data itself which is the default. You can also just specify where these things are relative to their data by an ex uh, a, sp a specific uh, numerical value for the location. You can specify uh, in an absolute sense where it should be relative to its data set and in a relative sense where it should be re uh, relative to its data set. And all oh, and there it is. You may uh, you may have, you may be wondering about the rotation option because this is frankly not a very good uh, visualization with all of these labels all smushed together. So I can specify an angle of pi over four and rotate these a little bit. That's a little bit better. I can rotate it all the way down to pi over two and place it at the bottom. And frankly, I think that is much more uh, visually uh, readable than some of the other options where everything was not rotated. <clears throat> and again, you can put everything above, below, to the side. You got all these options. And uh, so one other thing that you can do, in basically any plotting expression, you can wrap some of your data in the function legended. 
And what legend will do is it'll automatically add an annotation to the thing that you're trying to plot. Uh, so if I have one, two, legended three A, this three is going to get uh, an annotation associated with it. And so bar chart might not be the best example because the plot style I'm not even going to, I'm not going to try and do this right now, but um, with the default plot style, everything's the same color, but with a, this option down here, you can see that everything gets an automatic different color. And you can see that these two elements have been automatically uh, annotated with this le uh, legend on the side. So legended will automatically generate the legend for the expression. And here we can see another option down here or another example down here. And it just happens automatically. So uh, this is more restrictive in the sense that there are fewer options, but you can see exactly, I mean, you have fewer, you have less need for detailed customization with legends because the set of, the set of things it's intended to work with is a little bit smaller. It's not like everything is, supposed to have its own independent legend here, uh, it would make more sense if we were labeling every individual thing to just have a little label down here. Uh, but if we are using a chart legend, here are the options that we can use to change how that is displayed. So you can put it before, below, above, or after. So as you can see here, uh, the chart legends option does not automatically uh, generate something unless everything is different. Uh, basically, if these all these things look the same, there's no way to generate a legend for it, uh, as sort of I pointed out with that bar, bar legend chart. When we did it with uh, labeled, or excuse me, legended before, it did generate a legend. It's just not a very useful legend. The option chart legends will not do this automatically. We can, in fact, generate unique styles for all of the bar chart elements. Uh, and if all of them have unique styles, then it will be able to generate a legend. But as I mentioned before, it's not necessarily going to be a very useful or readable one. Uh, so. So chart legends only takes a list of elements that we are going to be uh, displaying. So basically, if I want, I could display everything, every independent data element with its own legend. And that's what automatic is going to do. Uh, but what you can also do is specify the list of elements. So I can specify that Mary and Elizabeth should have uh, legends associated with them. But all of these are still going to get their own independent uh, styles. <clears throat> I think this may have been intended for an earlier version of Mathematica in which this was a known issue. All right, I don't know what this is supposed to illustrate. All right, moving on. Okay. Hmm. So that's sort of what we have for labeling and plot. Uh, yeah, labeling options, various uh, options for the arrangement and uh, color and style and thickness and all of these other properties of uh, graphic expressions in the Wolfram language. As an aside, I should say that these are just the things that are built in. Uh, the Wolfram language is sufficiently robust, and all of these things are built out of lower level expressions. Uh, you can, in fact, construct whatever you want. 
in the Wolfram language just out of graphics primitives. You can specify, okay, I want a circle here, I want a line here, and circle, line, uh, rectangle, etc., are all graphics primitives that you can create programmatically. So I can just say, something like this. I can create a, uh, a graphic expression involving a disk and a line. And there we go. So I've specified a disk and a line, and I made, a, uh, I made the disk and the line. And you can make whatever you want uh, out of these graphics primitives. And as I'm going to be showing you uh, in a couple of uh, a couple more slides. Uh, you can in fact combine any of these graphics expressions with the plots and charts that you're already using as built-in functions. <clears throat> All right, so are there any questions on the material that we've covered so far? There's nothing in the chat yet. All right. OK. I realize that the point, I, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that there are a lot of built-in functions and options and styles for pretty much every kind of plotting function. Um, you will probably not need to use all of them, but if you're aware of them, if you're aware that, oh yeah, I think, uh, I think bar chart has some options that would you know, make this easier to, to plot. It can save you a lot of time in trying to put together a, a visualization for something that needs to satisfy a particular set of, uh, of style rules. Just being aware that it's there and, and you know, okay, I know that's there. Maybe I need to tweak it a little bit, but at least you can be aware that you have a solid starting point that incorporates most of the features that you need. All right. So is, is just to make sure, is the uh, appropriate notebook visible? It should be four arranging elements. I see learning objectives and arranging graphics elements. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. So um, we've already dealt with some of this, displaying uh, various parts of a graphic expression above or below something else. Um, and we're going to be talking about some of the other ways in which we can place elements within our graphics. Again, sort of the takeaway from this is that there are a lot of built-in options already there, and, uh, and you can use these to create graphs that satisfy whatever specifications you might need. So um, some specific options for bar chart are the bar origin. So where does the bar start? We can make it so it starts from the left, which is a little more traditional. Uh, excuse me, we started from the bottom, which is a little more traditional. We can also start from the left, the right, the top. We can put these bars wherever we want them. And, you know, if this is representing, I don't know, the depth of various holes, this may be a much more natural data visualization. We can change the spacing in between the bars. We can make it so that there is no space between the bars in the, in the, in the same data set. And we can change the space between the groups, uh, between the individual data sets themselves. So if you need the bar bars to be spaced out in a particular way, or if you think that would better illustrate your data, that is a built-in option. And similarly, there are options for rectangle chart and bar chart 3D and rectangle chart 3D that all exist with the same set of, uh, of options or analogous options in 3D space. Similarly, polar charts have a specific set of options that you might want to consider. Uh, there is the sector origin. And this is a, a convenient little uh, tool called a uh, a locator. Basically, it's a dynamic expression that you can just sort of click and drag in order to control some other uh, option. And we're actually going to be exploring dynamic options uh, and how they can be used in uh, a couple more uh, slides. Not in this notebook, in a different notebook. But again, the point being is that we've got a lot of options already built in. And we can change how all of these things happen. We can change the space between concentric expressions. We can change how far they pop out from each other. 
We can change the inner radius, the outer radius. We can change all of these things independently. Uh, we can also do things uh, with word clouds. If you want to make a word cloud and you want to make sure that the elements of the word cloud uh, sit in a particular mask, you can do that. I mean, this is kind of, this is getting into kind of, you know, cute sort of, you know, uh, marketing department presentation-y stuff, but, you know, it's there, rest assured. It's a little cute, maybe a little cute for, uh, for hard science, but it's there. Similarly, Bubble Chart and Bubble Chart 3D have their own independent options that govern things like bubble sizes and bubble scale. And Bubble Chart 3D has the analogous options in, uh, in three-dimensional space. You can change how these scales are governed. You can change how big they are. You can change what the minimum size is and the maximum size is if you want to highlight uh, sort of differences of scale between your data. So if you want the little things to look really little and you want the big things to look really big. Um, if you, you know, sometimes that may be misleading, but sometimes it may be necessary to more clearly visualize your data. So beyond all of the stuff that's inside the plot, you can also control the white space. You can control uh, the plot range padding. You can control the image padding and you can control the image margins. So basically, uh, if you have something that displays data in a particular range, by default, some padding is going to be included so that the stuff you're plotting doesn't just touch the axes. That is an independent option that you can control. Uh, similarly, there's going to be the graphics expression, uh, which is going to govern how large the image is uh, when it's actually rendered. And then there are going to be the image margins, which govern how much space is going to be left around the image in an actual notebook environment. And so again, these have their own methods for specification. Uh, you can specify exactly what the plot range is going to be in your uh, internal coordinate system. You can specify how much padding there should be uh, for the plot range and for the image. Uh, you can also directly specify the image size and, uh, and the aspect ratio and the image margins. Image size, uh, as, a, as a particular point, is specified in points and not pixels. That is something of a, uh, an important point. As uh, many people have high DPI monitors and points and pixels are not necessarily going to be the same thing on a high DPI monitor. Uh, so a 100, uh, a 100 pixel uh, expression on a 72 DPI monitor is going to be 72 points, whereas on a high DPI monitor, uh, it is going to be something else. And that is going to vary depending on exactly what uh, pixel density is present on your monitor. So just be conscious of that. Uh, I like to think of everything just relative to a 12 point font. If I have a 12 point font, I know how big that is. And so I can think of image size in printer's points compared to the size of a 12 point font. If my image, image size uh, is 144, I know that's as high as 12, 12 point uh, characters. And so, as I mentioned before, what we can do if we have something that we would like to add to a particular uh, plot is we can literally combine any graphics expression that we might want with whatever uh, plotting functions we have. So we can create graphics with a prologue layer and an epilogue layer. Uh, and we can see here sort of how that structure works. The prologue is drawn first, then the actual graphics themselves, then the labels that we've attached to those graphs, and then the epilogue. <laughs> So by default, labels are placed on top of the graphics, which makes sense. We want to make sure those labels are visible. And then the epilogue is just something that we can add on top of everything else in the plot. So we can start with a simple example, uh, just including uh, a single disk. And that is our graphics expression. And we can include a prologue. We can include something that is drawn before this disk. So it's an this disk is an offset graphics expression. It's an offset disk. And so our main graphics are drawn on top of it. And similarly, we can add an epilogue, which is drawn after the, uh, the main graphics are drawn. So no matter what kind of a, a plot you have, 
any graphics expression will support a prologue and epilogue as, uh, as various expressions that you can draw your plot on top of or uh, behind. And that may be useful for highlighting certain things, depending on how you want to do it. So as an example, you can see that here is a region plot of a particular uh, uh, cubic curve. And you can see that the uh, transparency of the main region plot is uh, indicating that the orange plot, excuse me, the orange disk is behind this plot and the purple disk is in front of this plot. So this is sort of a, a clear visualization of how these prologue and epilogue options interact with, uh, with the built-in plotting functions. And it also highlights what I was saying before about uh, plot supporting transparency and alpha channels and those combining in sort of the very natural way. Mm. Ah, yes, and you can use prologue and epilogue with 3D graphics expressions, but these graphics expressions that are drawn as prologue and epilogue are in fact uh, two dimensional. So what I can do, I'm gonna create a real quick example so I have graphics 3D. Let's say I have a sphere with a, a default size and I specify as a prologue, or rather, let's say epilogue. Which is just a default disk. Actually, I'm gonna make that a smaller disk. So I have this 3D graphic expression. I can do all of the ordinary stuff with it. I can rotate it. I could change the lighting or the perspective. But on top of that, I have drawn uh, a 2D graphic expression as an epilogue. And so the 3D graphics will always appear behind the epilogue and in front of the prologue. And so we can see just like we had before, the uh, prologue is drawn behind the 3D graphics expression and the epilogue is drawn on top of it. Hmm. We can also use uh, the function inset to insert whatever kind of graphics expression we want inside another graphics expression. So rather than displaying one on top of the other, we can, uh, we can set it so that one is designed to be displayed inside. Uh, and again, we can specify that, uh, we can specify where it should be in a, uh, a wide variety of ways. This might be useful if you wanna do sort of a picture in picture style plot. So we have one major plot and sort of a minor plot, which is intended as a point of comparison. And I can put that up here and I can change its size. And I can make something where a comparison chart is clearly visible via the inset. And you just, you know, you put in whatever you have in there, you, set, you say where you want it, you say how, much, uh, how far you want it offset, you say how big you want it and what direction it should be placed. Mm. Uh, and sort of the, uh, the workhorse of all of these graphics combining uh, expressions is the function show. So this doesn't do anything fancy. It'll just take uh, whatever graphics expressions you give to it and it'll try, it, it'll lay them on top of each other in order. Uh, so if I have a bar chart with particular image padding, I think I want to display these. So I just, I, I just have a very basic panel uh, for graphics here. And I have a second panel at a different scale, a different uh, vertical scale. If I show panel B and then panel A, we can see that the shorter one is displayed on top of the larger one. And that is because uh, panel uh, A or panel B is uh, displayed on top and panel A is displayed below that. And if I were to put something else back here,
that would be behind everything else, or that would be um, that would be on top of everything else. Sorry, I think I got that backwards. So panel B is drawn first, panel A is drawn on top of that, and then the graphics uh, that I specified as the third thing are drawn on top of that. <clears throat> and if I were to do this the other way, if I were to do panel A uh, first and then panel B, the shorter uh, the shorter bars of that first bar chart would be uh, invisible because they're behind the larger bars up here. <clears throat> As another uh, possible issue, if you specify some set of uh, options in the first plot, uh, the plot options will be inherited from whatever is in the first, uh, the first expression. So if you create uh, a plot which has a particular aspect ratio or a particular image size, whatever is first in that set of expressions is going to determine the size or aspect ratio of all subsequent expressions that you uh, combine together. And so there we go. And so we can see that individually This plot looks normal, but this is a log plot that is displayed on a different set of axes than this first plot. And so it looks like this. It looks, uh, it looks, it has a logarithmic axis for the y axis, but that is in fact not visible when we show these together because the actual, because the, the way these graphics are uh, displayed, the axis that is used is determined by the first expression. And so even though we would want this to be uh, displayed on a logarithmic axis, it instead gets displayed on a linear axis. And so that, that may not make sense depending on the graphic object, uh, graphics object you're trying to combine. <sighs> and uh, one of the nice things that has been added uh, in Wolfram language 12, 12.0, 12 is these, uh, this nice graphics grid expression. So if you have many things that you want to display and you want to put them all together, you can create this nice little grid uh, which displays all of them. And graphics grid, as opposed to regular grid, which I talked about previously, will automatically uh, ensure that everything is displayed at an appropriate size. Basically, it's a form of grid that is specifically designed to make sure that graphics look nice when you put them all together inside a graphics grid. It is, in fact, a graphics expression, so you can perform all of the graphics uh, manipulations that I've been talking about previously. You could add an epilogue or a prologue to it. You can combine it with other objects. It is just a graphics expression. And we can reproduce it using some of the other tools that we have, like inset. And so there we go. So if I create a grid as opposed to a uh, graphics grid. You can create, actually, I'm not sure I've mentioned that previously. Uh, if you have uh, something that is a graphics expression in the Wolfram language, you can convert that to a bitmap with a function rasterize. You can also export it to a PDF or EPS file format for use in, uh, in publications. You don't have to keep it as this built-in Wolfram language graphics expression. You can convert it or export it to a wide variety of other image formats. And so there are references to uh, all our various graphics uh, combining and styling tools in the uh, reference material. And there are some other uh, links to reference pages which discuss some of the uh, functions and options we've discussed in this uh, notebook in further detail. All right, are there any questions at the moment? All right, let's move on. This I think is kind of an important one. Um, previously, we've been talking about just, you know, I think the takeaway from these last few uh, notebooks is really that there are just so many things built into the Wolfram language, which will hopefully save you a lot of time if you're aware that they're there. Uh, you don't need to create something manually out of rectangle primitives. You can just use bar chart. It's there. It's built in. Uh, you don't need to you know, manually change the style of everything. You can just use one of the built-in styles. Uh, dynamic interactivity, however, is something that is kind of unique um, in how 
in the tools that you have and the kinds of things that you can make uh, using the Wolfram language. And just as an immediate aside, um, if you go to demonstrations.wolfram.com, there are a wide variety of examples there of dynamic interactive content and demonstrating topics in a wide variety of fields as well. Physics, mathematics, biology, chemistry, all, all kinds of things. <clears throat> and they all make use uh, to some degree of the dynamic interactivity features in the Wolfram language. Okay, so if you have, uh, if you have a notebook and you wanna send it to somebody else, uh, you can take advantage of the fact that the other, the user at the other end has access to the Wolfram language, and you can use uh, stuff that can exist in the Wolfram language to make content more, more clear. Sometimes, you know, a little animation is much, much more useful than uh, than a static series of plots. And so we have a whole bunch of features. Uh, that allow you to change all of these things uh, in real time and allow another user to change all of these things in real time. I've been, I've been using a whole bunch of these uh, in the previous slides to change these uh, plot elements, but you can construct dynamic plot elements of your own that will rely on a slider or some kind of 2D locator or just a drop-down menu or something like that. These are all built in. All of these things were just created with the tools in the Wolfram language, and these tools are very accessible. <clears throat> All right. So sort of the obvious one, whenever you create a 3D graphics expression, you will notice that you can click and rotate on it. That is in fact, a piece of uh, dynamic visualization that can be very useful. Uh, being sure that people can view your expressions from different sides uh, can be useful for visualization. <clears throat> So, and many of these other functions already uh, take, make use of the tools in the Wolfram language that exist for dynamic interactivity. So there's tooltip and status area, which are built-in functions that you can use yourself are already used internally inside bar chart and pie chart. And so these, uh, these are other examples of uh, dynamic visualization that has already been implemented for you. So which highlight the kinds of things that you can do, but there are other options as well, and you can use these uh, with a great degree of freedom to create your own visualizations. So tooltip is sort of a natural one that we've already popped up, uh, that we've already seen. So what we can do is we can create a tooltip that displays not just the numbers, but also uh, a little more information than that. So we can display a column of a label and the data. And so we can, we can see what this data is supposed to represent by hovering over it without having to have a label on the side or some kind of annotation. You know, this might not be the best way to do it, but it is a very powerful option that allows you to put uh, more data in uh, to this visualization without cluttering it up. You can also, you can also do things like animate. Uh, you can create an animation. You can see all of these things side by side and just sort of go back and forth. You can change the animation rate, which controls the, uh, how quickly this progresses. You have a lot of options. Um, now, the most powerful thing in the Wolfram language, uh, the most powerful uh, function for this uh, dynamic interactivity is of course dynamic. So any expression that is wrapped in dynamic will automatically update. So the function clock will automatically update. <clears throat> And that will uh, control how, uh, which element of data is being displayed. So I think uh, to explain a little more clearly what's going on, you can say dynamic of x. And if I write x equals 4 and evaluate that, then dynamic of x automatically changes up here. And if I change that to something else, evaluate it, it automatically changes up here. There are expressions in the Wolfram language that return times or dynamically update 
uh, automatically. And if I change, if I put this inside of a dynamic expression, this will automatically uh, update. Oops. Actually, don't know why that doesn't update dynamically. Clock. There we go. All right. So clock is an example of something that is going to update dynamically. And I can see how it uh, is changing with time. I'm not doing anything. This is just automatically progressing. Uh, and because it's wrapped in dynamic, the automatic updating is displayed in the notebook. And I can use that. And as we've seen previously, we have uh, expressions like tooltip. Let me just magnify that a little more so it's visible. So we can see that we can put little annotations and tooltips in our data sets so that when we hover over them, we get a little message. Uh, now, this is just kind of used as sort of a, a goofy example, but we can do this for you know pretty much anything. Like I said before, we can use these tooltips and uh, sort of dynamic little pop-ups to increase the density of our, our data that we're displaying, but without cluttering up the screen anymore. We also have mouse over, which allows you to do sort of the same thing. Uh, where if I have an expression, I have an expression that is displayed, and then if I mouse over it, it displays something else. So I, and when I'm not mousing over, it displays this plot. When I am mousing over, it displays another plot. Another option is pop-up window. So you can make it so that uh, the things you create, when you click on them, uh, will create a little pop-up window and display another uh, expression. So whenever I click on this, it'll bring up this little pop-up window that is labeled and contains another, uh, uh, another plot. Again, it's about increasing the density of the data without necessarily uh, making the, the chart harder to read. Another thing, oh. another thing you can do is put all this information inside a pane. Uh, so you can say, okay, uh, I have a lot of information, but I don't want it to get outside of a particular area. I don't want it to clutter up this notebook. And so you can put it inside a pane, which has a controllable size, and you can make sure everything fits inside there, uh, and you can scroll through it. So let's say if I make this small so that only one uh, thing displays on it, I can actually scroll up and down inside this pane. Again, increasing the density of data without necessarily making the notebook harder to navigate. Uh, and as it's been mentioned here, if you don't have something appearing at the size you expect, i.e. if you have a row, uh, which is intended to display things in a row, uh, it's not very good for graphics, which is why we also have graphics row. But you can also wrap that thing in pane. And so wrapping data one in pane causes this uh, plot to display at a much larger uh, size, which might, uh, which might be desirable. OK. So yeah, so we've got a whole bunch of other dynamic visualization tools that allow you to see different pieces of information associated with a single uh, apparent plot. So if I have this, I can click on it and then it'll change uh, to the next plot in the series. I can go through it uh, like a slideshow. I can create a little pop-up view. 
I can create a menu, which allows you to select uh, the charts individually. I can see it as tabs. These are all perfectly valid options, which you've seen used in the previous few uh, uh, notebooks. All of, these have, all of these items have been present in some form or another in, uh, in the notebooks in which we've been exploring the different data options or data visualization options. Uh, and so you, you can sort of get the idea. So this goes through it like a slideshow. This progresses through on click. This displays a drop-down menu. This has a drop-down menu up here above the actual data. And this has tabs. Some other uh, useful dynamic constructions are checkbox, which allow you to turn something on and off. You have a radio button bar, which allows you to select between a few different options. You have a toggler. Again, when you click on it, it progresses to the next thing. You have a setter, which allows you to turn something on and off. A setter bar, which allows you to turn one of several different things on and off, and a pop-up menu. Straightforward. And so you can see how this gets controlled by this thing up here because it's a dynamic expression and is affected by other things happening in the notebook. So yes, yeah, so checkbox turns things on and off. Toggler allows you to select between different states. Radio button bar allows you to you know, select one from a list of things. Uh, <clears throat> setter allows you to turn one thing on and off. Setter bar allows you to turn one of several things on and off. And setter bar has uh, several options that allow you to arrange those results individually in a particular way. So you can array, uh, arrange all these things as a grid rather than an actual row. And so you've got setter bar, which uh, you got arranged in a different way. So I can, put, I can put these elements in any order I want. I can also make a little pop-up menu that uh, displays these things like this. It's all, these are all sort of building blocks that you can use to construct user interfaces for a particular demonstration. So you can make something where you want to display uh, several different charts. And you know, maybe you have several different things that you want to display simultaneously. And you can sort of use these to flip back and forth between the two uh, relatively easily without having to clutter everything up. So uh, these are all items that allow you to select a single thing. So if you want to display a single pane uh, or a single chart out of many at a particular time, you can also set things up so that you can display multiple things at the same time or select several things at the same time. And so you can see here that when I select or deselect, uh, various elements of this checkbox bar, different data sets appear in this, uh, in this dynamic list block. You can turn all of them on or off individually using any one of these controls. And so you can see the checkbox bar, as, it, as you might expect, is a list of checkboxes. Toggler bar is a list of toggleable buttons. Turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. And list picker allows you to get this little drop down list and turn each one of these on and off independently. <clears throat> um, so these are all things that are built in constructs. Uh, you also have just sort of a, a more low level expression, which is button. So you can see that this is a button. This is also a button. And this is a plot uh, where the graphics expression where the, the, the curve itself acts as a button. So you can see that on clicking this button, it prints I have clicked. The image, when you click it, prints image was clicked. And when you plot this curve, or when you click on this curve here, it says graphics function was clicked. So basically, any expression in the Wolfram language can be made into a button that, when you click it, it performs an action. Well, that's odd. Regardless. Um, so you can take basically any expression, and you can add elements to it. 
Uh, so you can add a dialog box to it so that when you click it, whatever it prints out is going to, uh, is going to pop up a little box and say, hey, you click this. It could also open up a palette when you click it. Oops. So yeah, so basically all of these individual dynamic elements have their own independent options that you can use to customize your dynamic presentation in any way you want. Uh, and just there are, there are a few more. Uh, so you've got buttons. You've also got button bar. And each of those can do something independent. You've got action menu. And each of those acts like a button. Uh, yeah, so it's effectively a pop-up menu of button. <clears throat> and so here you can see, like, putting all of these things together, you can create a number of different, uh, you can put a number of different things into a grid. So you can put, uh, you can put different buttons and different controls into this sort of dynamic control panel here. And so whatever I do in here will produce something different. It'll have a different effect. And so if you want to create a set of dynamic visualizations and then make it so that people can access them easily, some kind of construct like this can be very effective. Hmm. And so we can see here, where's labeled data? Where'd label data go? Heck. All right. But you can see that uh, the, you can see how things are getting passed to the function. So you can see that this expression I have here is, uh, is getting called with a particular value from the selector. So I can see that as I select these things, they are getting put into uh, this pane selector function. <clears throat> yeah, and so there's all that. That is how that works. So you have panes, you have buttons, you have drop down menus, you have button bars, you got radio button bars, you got uh, a whole lot of things. <clears throat> and so you can create a little scrolling pane right here. And you can you know, resize that. You can scroll through it. And you can click on each of these things. And that will update the dynamic value of some other expression. So I click on this. It changes the dynamic value of this. All right. So dynamic visualization is very powerful. It is one of the, the, one of the ways in which the Wolfram language is very useful. Um, and I do highly recommend that you all check out demonstrations.wolfram.com and try some of the, pre uh, the demonstrations that are available there. Because that, that I, you know, this is all somewhat contrived data, which is intended to be instructive and show what examples are there. But I think it's also very valuable to see what kinds of things people actually use these for. Because there are, you know, like I said, a wide variety of different fields, which all can benefit from concise, uh, dynamic visualization, you know, keeping that data um, easily presentable, but also being dense, also conveying a lot of information simultaneously. All right. Um, so are there any questions on the dynamic uh, visualization options? Okay. So dynamic visualization is a huge topic in the Wolfram language. Uh, and so we have some very, very detailed and comprehensive guides on sort of the, the underlying structure. The introduction to manipulate tutorial right there, an introduction to dynamic, 
are both very good if you want to understand sort of how this works under the hood. Not just what you can do with it, but also how it works at a lower level and what you can use, uh, what tools you have available to you to construct more detailed things. All right. So there we have one more notebook to, uh, to look at. It's mainly, it mainly consists of sort of exercises that you can work through. They're sort of step-by-step -step, uh, exercises that uh, are valuable to work through sort of on your own. Uh, because these are worked through sort of step-by-step -step in the presentation, I don't really want to make these part of the, uh, the project presentations that you're going to be doing next Wednesday. Um, but these are valuable for seeing uh, examples, just as exploring demonstrations.wolfram.com is. So we can sort of take a, a quick look through this and see uh, how people, uh, how these options can be used to put together a nice coherent uh, graphics demonstration. <clears throat> so we can see some examples um, of various data dense visualizations that still manage to be uh, visually not overwhelming uh, because they use uh, all these options effectively. So here's an example where we have life expectancy, literacy rate, and population, uh, a three-dimensional, uh, well, really a, uh, a four-dimensional set of data because we have uh, these two variables, we have the population size, and we have the location as indicated by these indices. <clears throat> and so, but it is immediately clear like where, you know, these various uh, African, Asian, European, and North American uh, nations are sort of fitting in this, uh, in this chart. It's immediately readable and it's immediately clear what the data is showing us. Um, <clears throat> We also have, you know, just good visualization, time and value, time and value uh, combined with a, uh, an actual visual size indicator in a bar chart. I know exactly what this chart is saying. I know in a very precise sense what, it, uh, what numbers it's giving me. And I also just have a clear visual trend uh, from the, the, the visualization of the uh, data. We can do something a little a little funnier, where we can combine uh, different names and we can see how they all uh, compare over time. Uh, we can we can use sort of a uh, a color function, which is pure white outside of a particular cutoff value, to just sort of truncate all of the data that is a little too noisy or low level to be uh, useful. And we can clearly see uh, what the indicators of this uh, of this chart are. Gladys. You may know some very old Gladyses, but you probably don't know any young Gladyses. And that is very clear on this chart. And so uh, we saw before, you know, what, uh, how the various uh, populations uh, between people with different names stack up. And we can literally, oops, I think this is, I think this is actually just an image of a static plot. Uh, regardless, so this is an example illustrating the kind of thing that you can do. And this notebook here, which uh, I uploaded to the Slack channel earlier, along with the other uh, lecture notebooks, includes a number of projects that you can work, can work through that walk through how each of these uh, these um, these charts here were created. Uh, I am not going to ask you to present these, but I think they are good to work through just to get, you know, a hands-on experience with how these uh, kind of, kinds of kinds of charts and visualizations are created. And of course, if you have any questions about these, please feel free to ask me in the Advanced Mathematica Slack channel. 